Good evening. My name is Roger, and it is really a pleasure to have all of you here this evening in order to be able to welcome you to this very important panel. I'm an associate professor in criminology and criminal justice and the director of the Policy Study Center. And on behalf of UTSA and especially President Amy and all the UTSA family, I wanna welcome you to our virtual plan panel, Resistance and Resilience, Lessons from the Chicano Movement of the 60s and 70s. The sponsors of this Hispanic Heritage Month panel are the College for Health, Community and Policy and the Westside Community Partnerships. In March of 1967, five young Chicano graduate and undergraduate college students would meet at various locations across the West Side, including the famous Fountain Room, which was a cozy bar just a few blocks away from St. Mary's University to discuss politics and the social condition of Chicanos in San Antonio, all over Texas, and indeed all over the, the nation. The founders of Mayo, otherwise known as Los Cinco or the Five, consisted of Jose Angel Gutierrez, Willy Velasquez, Mario Compian, Ignacio Perez, and Juan Patlan. Unfortunately, both Willy and Juan left much too soon. But this evening, we have the three remaining founders of Mayo, Jose Angel Gutierrez, Mario Compian, and Ignacio Perez. And together, we'll explore the history of the Chicano movement, including the history of the political upheaval or the political changes at that time, uh, their ideologies, strategies, tactics. And then we will also hopefully get to discuss a little bit of the lessons of the past and look toward the future with the, under the current uh, political climate. Uh, tonight, we'll have uh, Mario Compian. I'd like to introduce Mario. He's been working towards social justice since he graduated from Edgewood High School as the co-founder of the historic political machines like Mayo, uh, the Committee for Barrio Betterment, the Texas Raza Unida Party. Uh, he was also the builder of the Mexican American Unity Council, Centro Cultural Atzlan, and he's really dedicated his entire life to the betterment of uh, the Mexican American community. Jose Angel Gutierrez was born in Crystal City, Texas, served in the U.S. Army. He's a professor emeritus in political science at UT Arlington, and has been fighting for equal rights for Chicanos for over 50 years. He's won numerous awards the name as one of the 100 outstanding, uh, but after uh, uh, some time in academia uh, at a variety of positions, uh, ultimately also graduating from the University of Houston. So it is indeed our prospect that Ignacio Perez will be with us. Ignacio has been working his entire adult life in the field of organizing and educating uh, the disenfranchised, not only in Texas, but really across the nation. And his work has taken him as far as Central America. His goal of empowering Latinas and Latinos has been at the center of his work while building organizations like MOC into community development organization that has strived very hard to address the issues of affordable housing and supporting uh, business development with finance. Well, they're, they're still the main man. Well, they're not here with us virtually. I do want to say, you know, Billy Velasquez presente, Juan Patlan presente. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have two uh, great moderators for this event. Uh, that I think will have some very distinctive perspectives. The first is Juliana Rodriguez. She's a senior majoring in, uh, at UTSA, majoring in criminology and criminal justice with a minor in politics and law. 
in the College for Health, Community, and Policy. She's a graduate of Harlandale High School. She's a McNair scholar who's done uh, undergraduate research on Latino satisfaction with policing. They're going to ask me, or they're going to ask me a question. Uh, her goal is to attend law school and to ultimately become an immigration attorney. And then last, but not certainly not at least, we have uh, Jesse Bata, who's been at UTSA since 1976. But while well, many may not know that while he was at UTS, UT Austin in the late 1960s, Zapata helped form Mexican American student organization there, which sub Zapata and several other African American faculty association, which we now know as La Raza Fac Group's first chair. He's held numerous administrative positions uh, at the university in addition to being a full professor in the department of Canada, a good man down. Uh, so he's now a professor emeritus at UTSA. And with that, I will say, Dr. Zapata, the stage is all yours. Roger, thank you very much for that great introduction. Uh, and I'd like to uh, say that Juliana and I are very pleased to be moderators for this panel. Uh, all three of you are people that I have admired and respected for many years. Um, we'll dive right into the questions so that we don't uh, take up too much more time. We obviously have a limited amount of time, so we do need to do that. Mario, the first question goes to you. Um, and I don't need to insult you and the others. Many, many of our viewers tonight were not born when Mayo was creation panels that led to the creation of Mayo. And again, let me remind all the panelists that we have a limited, limited amount of time. And while I understand that any one of these questions could take hours to discuss, please limit yourself to some degree anyway. Mario? Thank you, Jesse. Uh, thank you, Roger, and uh, the rest of the crew. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, welcome, uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, that's in the audience, both at, uh, uh, in the UTSA community and, and, and externally. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to share this kind of history, talk about the history that, that we made as young activists. And uh, so uh, we'll, I'm uh, pleased to be able to share uh, that, that history. As since I just uh, a few days ago turned 80, and I so all I'm glad that I'm 80. And, that, and secondly, of course, I said, glad that I'm able to, to share the history with, with you. On to your question, uh, ambitions that, that were prevalent at the time in, in uh, not only in San Antonio, in the west and south side barrios, the east side, the, but elsewhere in South Texas, throughout the state where the where Chicanos communities were at. And this is, what is that uh, poverty was prevalent. Uh, many of our families are, are people experiencing poverty, uh, high unemployment rates. Okay. And of course, in, um, the, uh, in terms of our how uh, economic opportunity, the very low uh, education levels that, were, that prevented them from, from, uh, from progressing, making social progress. So those are the kinds of conditions that we set out to address to change from uh, Mayo and other organizations later on. Okay, thank you. Juliana? Thank you, Mario, for the uh, answer to the question. Um, now, Ohio was instrumental in coordinating the high school walkouts in the late 60s. Those walkouts were successful in energizing people under 18 years old and getting them politically active. How was that done and, how, and can that be replicated today? 
Nacho, you're muted. Nacho, you need you need to unmute. How about that? Yes. Uh, okay. Now we hear you. Okay, great. Yes. Um, I think it was sixty something. Probably sixty-seven, sixty-eight, when uh, uh, Mayo had an office, small office in Guadalupe Street, and um, there was some sort of, um, not necessarily a a a uh, walkout of Lanier High School. Uh, it was more like a stand down. They all walked out of the classroom. And, uh, uh, because of people like Joe Bernal and others that were active in talking to the parents of the students to try to resolve the issue. So we met, I met part of some of the students and I said, well, what do you guys want? And they said, well, you know, they looked at each other and they talked about it and said, well, look, let's go write it down. So we went to our Mayo office and we wrote down uh, what the students wanted, whatever, I, something about cheerleaders and, you know, different high school stuff. So uh, uh, that's how we uh, got, we had already, for Mayo, we had already had some small income and uh, this was our, almost our first kind of uh, action in the community, so to speak. Thank you for that. Angel, in the 1970s, only 30% of Hispanics 25 years and old and over completed high school and less than 5% completed college. There was progress in 2018, 72% graduated from high school and 13% have a bachelor's degree. Unfortunately, Hispanics still lag behind other ethnic groups with respect to educational attainment. When you helped form Mayo 50 years ago, did you think the gap would persist now? Now, what went wrong? Well, personally, I didn't think uh, we were going to uh, continue to live under those at that time, we were probably the age of Juliana or younger, and being such, we were idealists. We had no in context. You know, Texas was one of the last states uh, to desegregate public schools around 57, 58. So 10 years later, we're still having the same problem because we didn't have separate schools, but we were still segregated within the schools. That is, and we did, were still under English only. Uh, the curriculum then and the curriculum now was still Anglo-centric. All we learn about is them. We never learn about us. Uh, and here we are today, the majority of students in many of the Southwestern states, uh, the Mexican origin children, and they're still learning about them and not about themselves. So fortunately, the graduates from colleges are being taught under the same Anglo-centric curriculum. And at a point. So the ignorant are teaching because at the days of Mayo, when these walkouts were going on, we were the majority of the schools that we were walking out. And the personnel were all Anglo teachers, the administrators were all Anglo, the school board was all Anglos. Uh, and so, you know, it's basically the same problem, except some of the problems today is ourselves. Because many of us are on school boards, many of us are on programs at universities, many of us are teachers, and we don't change the curriculum. It's still Anglo-centric. So you're not surprised or are you surprised that those conditions continue? Well, as I alluded to, Morgan said in college, you know, we grew older. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a young man now, he, 
is as, as old as Mario. Although in, in the, among the founders, Juan Patlan was the oldest. Then Mario came to school. Of course, Patlan is, is deceased. But, you know, uh, uh, I came up with something called the political generation, mixing biology and, and uh, time. And he said that every 20 years, you know, we replace ourselves. So those of us that are not like us, those are the ones that, that dropped out in junior high and high school, those are the ones that already replaced themselves. But we, we saw as the third generation, the first one being the Lulac people who came across, one million Mexicans left Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, like my father and, and others. Uh, and then the, the second group that got together was the, the GF Forum with Hector uh, Garcia. Uh, and those people were assimilationists. They wanted to be quite like They thought that was the answer to our problem. Do like, for example, said you had to be a citizen and they had the English to the flag. They wouldn't allow uh, generations to us. And so when we were born, we thought this is home. We were meeting in school. So we thought we were going to be able to change everything. And we started to. But we also had kids. Uh, they, they began to call themselves Hispanics. Uh, and and back was Latinos and Latinas. Uh, now some of them want to call themselves Latinx. So every generation defines things in a different way. So they've kind of forgotten about some of these problems that then and exist today. Okay. Thank you. Juliana, before we ask the next question, I need to direct some comments to our technicians. We're getting a lot of feedback, and I presume you're working on it. Um, I don't hear it anymore, but so go ahead, Juliana, ask your question. Yes, thank you. So this one uh, goes to Jose Angel. Um, in the 1970s, the Chicano elect electorate was largely ignored by both political parties. Can you explain the events that gave rise to the formation? of the uh, of time is right to form a third party again. Well, the answer to the last question is yes, I think so. <laughs> but first, you've got to destroy it all. Now, going back in time, as I mentioned, LULAC and GF Forum were the major organization, but there was a third one that came out of San Antonio, and that was under the direction of Albert Peña. And that was PASO, the Political Association of Spanish-speaking Organizations. That was the first group that said, we are going to be political in, in their name, political association. But again, with the question of identity, they said we were Spanish-speaking, you know, not Mexican origin. Nobody wanted to be Mexican. Nobody still wants to be Mexican. So PASO was a direct action organization. And in my hometown, they fielded a slate of candidates and they won for the city council. They took it over. And it made international news. In fact, the Mexican president invited him over <laughs> to meet because he couldn't believe that people in this other Mexico were taking power. Now, LULAC and GF Forum were against, but LULAC and GF Forum did not agree that we should run and take over city government, that we should have self-determination. This is in several books that you can read on your own. So PASO eventually collapsed. Uh, they got embroiled there because of relationship with the Teamsters Union and, and other kind of funding. So that went by the wayside. We then are, are beginning to meet in 67 uh, at, at San Antonio, in San Antonio. We came from different parts of the state, but we were very frustrated that we had no option. You know, we, we didn't want to join LULAC. We didn't want to join GF Forum. There was not much of PASO left to join, uh, and we thought they were the problem. Again, this generational issue that we thought we could fix it and they didn't know any better. Uh, young people always say that they discovered everything. And so the first question to Mario was very important. You know, a lot of people today weren't born or weren't here because immigrants from Central America. So they don't understand what the hell we talk about when we say the Chicano movement or the civil rights movement. They, they don't know what that is or want to know. Yet this is, this is the foundation of where we are with our civil rights struggles. So, you know, we, we had those kinds of issues. And George Wallace, to, to get specific now, George Wallace ran for president in 1968. And of course, we were not segregations, but we were bright. You know, we were a third generation of, of, of Mexican origin kids in the US. We were kind of college educated, some of us, 
uh, we had finished school. We, we read their books. We understood their, their theories and their formulas. So we started saying, you know, Wallace has got a good idea, man. He's going to split the vote. He's going to take the, the votes of his base. Same thing Trump is doing in 2016 and is going to do it again. So we need to develop our base. So why don't we form our own party? And we started investigating and trying to do that. Nobody except Juan Cornejo in Crystal City said, I want to do this. But we couldn't get our party organized then. So he ran under the American party for sheriff. Because he lost 16 candidates at 115 right off the bat. Good. Thank you. Nacho, when Mario um, and Angel moved over to La Raza Unida Party and devoted their energy to them, you and Willie focused on voter registration and education. Can you explain why that happened and, and, and how you went about doing your work? Natra, I think you need to unmute again. Can you explain nope. why that happened and how you went about doing your work? You do, yes. The question was the, the question is that you, you and, and Willie focused on voter registration and education. Why was that? Well, it was always Willie's intention to look at um, uh, increasing the number of voters to get to voter registration. And, uh, this was because we had already formed the Mexican American Unity Council and uh, uh, trying to decide what direction it should take. Okay. Uh, uh, Willie didn't win that argument. Uh, we decided to continue as a community development organization, focusing on jobs and on Uh, development and helping business people grow. Uh, Willie took um, 74 or 73 around there, he formed uh, the Southwest Voter Registration Project. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, the rest is history. He was um, extremely successful and uh, 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 to his credit. Okay. What, what, what impact could that effort have today given the current situation? Well, I'm not as versed as I should be, I suppose, on the actual uh, uh, voter numbers. But anytime you increase the, your effort in door to door, precinct by precinct, uh, uh, that kind of activity, you, you're encouraging more and more people to be involved. And when they weren't doing anything except maybe listening on TV, this gives them uh, an opportunity to actually see someone and uh, something to join, something concrete. And I believe that's uh, the most important thing that the door-to-door -door kind of registration does for people that get involved, much like, much like uh, Southwest Voter did for many, many years. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, it says, we know that Rosie Castro, Choco Mesa, and other women were instrumental in the formation and success of Mayo. Can you elaborate of the role that women played in Mayo? Well, they played almost every kind of role you can think of. You know, when we first started Mayo, uh, our wives, at least, Juan Patlan was the only one that was married at the time when we started meeting. Uh, I got married July of 67, so I was the second one. Uh, and then I, re I don't remember when uh, Nacho got married or Mario, but they got married also. Willie was the last one to get married. So in the, in the first wives, you know, Elena, my wife, and, and Luz, my wife, they were central 
people, they came to our meetings, they, they, they helped raise funds, uh, they recruited other people, and then we had jobs. As Mario alluded to, there was a war on poverty program. Uh, I was a counselor there, and others, you know, Nacho was with the Bishop's Committee, and other, everybody had other different kinds of jobs, but we weren't getting paid for any of this. Okay? So we recruited people that liked our rhetoric, and I remember recruiting right off the bat Irma Mireles, who later became our, our, our candidate and leader and, and still very active. Uh, and, and remember, we had a debate mm -hmm. against uh, Henry B. Gonzalez, uh, not only at St. Mary's, but at Our Lady of the Lake. And from that debate, we recruited Rosie Castro. Uh, those people became active. Uh, and in every community, every chapter we had a mile, some did not want women you know, in their group. Others welcomed women. And many of our walkouts were led by women. So they always played a central role, but you know, historically, women have always had the problems of being in the, the traditional role or imposed the traditional role of being females, of having babies, taking care of husband and the babies at home. That doesn't leave much time to do community work. More importantly, they weren't. It wasn't seen proper for a woman to be. You know, it's just the women. It just was not the way it was. But we, I think we opened the door to women's leadership with the Chicano movement. Now, the second thing, and I want to add to see if, if Nacho and Mario agree with me, one of the things that we never get credit for as Mayo is nation building. You know, we created the, the Unity Council. We created the Southwest Council that later became the National Council, which is now Unidos. We created MOLDEF. You know, we were not the lawyers, but, you know, we were the ones who were the plaintiffs that they were trying to defend. There was no lawyers to help us and the voter registration project. We created all these organizations so that we didn't have to do it. In other words, we didn't want to spend time registering voters, let somebody else do that. We didn't want to have to be defending ourselves in court, let somebody else do it. And in that sense, we became the nation builders of, of Aslan. That was one of our concepts, that we are a nation within a nation. Mario, Mario what, what can you to that, the, uh, the, the, the organization. Mario? The organizations, uh, those are major contributions. What's your take on that? Well, the, <clears throat> I'm not sure that that's the only contribution that we made. No, it's uh, not, by all means. Uh, the legacy is much broader. Uh, the, uh, the, for example, uh, earlier we were talking about the walkout. Uh, the walkout uh, were uh, contributed uh, immensely. No, Mario, turn off YouTube. Other areas of leadership. Uh, Earlier, we were talking about the curriculum. Workouts uh, were the catalyst uh, for the transformation of the curriculum, especially with uh, respect to bilingual education. Okay, Mario, and Mario, we're getting some, we're get, Mario, we're getting some interference. And, uh, I think we're trying to work it out. Getting them ready so they could go to college. One of the historic pollutions of uh, the effects of the system. And uh, we also need to talk about the political, the contributions of the political area. And in that uh, both Mayo and Arasa Rida forced the opening of the political system in the state of Texas. Not only San Antonio, but in the state of Texas. But also contributions that have been long left. A great deal to better or other contributions we make. But I well, please. And now you need to unmute again. Mario, you need to unmute. Oh, 
you summarize it, please? Can you repeat the question again, Jesse? Well, basically, uh, the the issue was that uh, we're building on what Angel said that Mayo led to the establishment or helped create a lot of different organizations to handle many of the different things that needed to be addressed. And I was just asking for your perspective on that. And you indicated that, that there was much more that Mayo did than these organizations. And I don't think people could hear all of that. We're building on what Angel said that Mayo led to the establishment or helped create a lot of different organizations to handle many of the different things that needed to be addressed. And I was just asking, and I don't think people could hear all of that. Yes, I you know, uh, the, the movement uh, included uh, uh, groups that addressed uh, many dimensions of the Chicano experience, uh, the cultural, the art, uh, music, and so on. So there were groups formed around those, those, uh, uh, those needs. And uh, so the movement was a big umbrella that, that included all of these groups. However, I, I want to emphasize that Mayo and La Rambla fight to privacy. They had been in for the previous century. We wanted to overthrow the system of white supremacy. And that's why my own actually are focused on the political aspect of it. But yet, again, uh, there were many other groups in the arts, for example, locally, San Antonio, you still, have, you still see some of the groups that started way back like then. Not only in the community development area, like the Executive American Unity Council, but in the arts, the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center, Central Cultural Arts Club, those are, are organizations that were very important to the movement. In social movements, the social movements throughout the world, you know, the cultural workers have always played an important role. And they did the movement. Chicano theater, Chicano music, Chicano actors, and like okay, thank you, Mario. Nacho, if we can get back to Mario for a little bit, why why did Mario fade out? What happened? Was it was it such a successful effort that it wasn't needed anymore? Now, Angel alluded to the possibility that people aged out, but what's your take on on what happened to Mario? You need to unmute. Is that to me? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we got busy with other stuff. Mayo was, uh, as we looked at it, at, uh, 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 an organization of organized, among those things were, I think it was at Osmo and Billy Velasquez. Uh, Johnson, whoever the president was, uh, had a, a conference with Mexican Americans, and that's the first time that I think that uh, uh, the term "raza unida," in terms of a uh, overall generic term for what we're doing or trying to do, uh, became uh, public. In fact, uh, that was in September. In October. Uh, and I think I was there in uh, Sacred Heart Church in El Paso in October. Uh, it was the first rump conference of Rasunida. And uh, uh, things just snowballed from there. Uh, Ford Foundation had given uh, African American groups money in the East Coast. Because of stuff like this, uh, uh, they uh, heard about uh, people here in the Southwest. And uh, People formed the Southwest Council of La Raza in Phoenix 
a lot of our, our, our Southwestern leaders. And uh, Mexican American Unity Council actually incorporated in order to be able to uh, receive a non, uh, a funding as a nonprofit to, to uh, carry out its programs. So, so many things are going on simultaneously in 67 and 68 that it just, uh, it's hard to, it was hard to keep up. It was impossible for us to be involved or take the leadership roles. Other people took those roles and moved forward. Okay. Uh, Angel, in the 2016 presidential election, 28% of Hispanics voted for Donald Trump. Recent polling suggests that those numbers might be higher in 2000. Thinkable, at least I think it was, that that, that large share of Hispanics could support a candidate like Trump that espouses harsh anti immigrant rhetoric. What has happened to the Hispanic electorate? It's our own, it's our own delusional <laughs> thinking. <laughs> because, you know, we, we, we pride ourselves that we're Hispanics, uh, that we're Latinos, and there were 60 million, and we're this, and we're that. Just count the Mexican origin people, okay? We are 64% of this larger group. If you do that, you begin to understand that's not who that 25% is that voted for Trump. Those are the Cubans. And yet we're forced to embrace them as if they're our, they're our kind. They may be from our Spanish-speaking country, but they're not like us. They're not our kind. Okay. Let's talk about political math and why they're so important and why Trump is so focused on Florida, for example. Republicans have you know, an equal number of both more or less five and five. <clears throat> Go to the other side. Now there's seven, it isn't two, because if there's seven here and you make up the two that you lost, you're still losing. Even if you get one more and get six, you're still losing. And if you get one more, which means four, you're just tied. So losing one vote is actually like four in political math. It's not the same thing as two and two is four and so on. But we don't understand that. We have people among us that vote against us. Right now, the largest group of Mexican origin people that are voting Republican are those who are in the Border Patrol. 53% of the migra is now Hispanics. 53%, that's the only federal agency that is overrepresented. All the rest of the other agencies in the federal government discriminate against us. We're not overrepresented, okay? Uh, blacks have the post office, we got the border patrol. Okay, so can you imagine people paying the hot other Mexicans, their relatives? They're not gonna vote for Biden, they're gonna vote for Trump because they wanna keep their job, they wanna keep expanding and, and, and growing. So. The enemy is us, within us. Now, if we organize our base, Mexican origin people, precinct by precinct, uh, city by city, where we can, there's no point in organizing, say, I forgot now the geography of San Antonio and the demography, but let me just say that at one time, Terrell Hills in San Antonio was basically all white. Well, why do you want to organize, uh, you know, 10% of the people in Terrell, in Terrell Hills? They're not gonna make a difference. You go organize in the west side, the south side, the east side, uh, maybe now the northwest side, that's where our Uh, especially on school boards. Uh, I think the median age is, uh, median education is about sixth grade. So how is a school board member going to take on a superintendent? Besides most of our superintendents are Anglos across, across the 1600 some odd school districts in the state. So they just simply go along with whatever the person is, is tells them that they're going to do. Uh, we do not have competent, capable, visionary uh, organizations. Now, uh, adding to what Mario and, and Nacho were saying,
uh, we a bill that, uh, as we did in, in, in the counties where we took over in the Winter Garden, we even formed labor union. Uh, Obreros Unidos uh, in Crystal City, they called the Teamsters, and we did. Uh, and throughout the south part of Texas, we organized a lot of community-based organizations, all ending with the word Unidos. Mexicanos Unidos, Ciudadanos Unidos, Familias Unidas, all over the southwest in, in Texas, okay, and into south Texas. So we were very successful in many, many things, and that nation building is not uh, something that we get credit for. Okay, could you tell us how you really feel? <laughs> I wish I was 26. I still have a beer, but I want to do this again because I have unfinished it. Juliana, uh, there's a one last question uh, that number 10. I, I, I wish that you would ask that, and then we'll open it up to the, to the panel to express any other thoughts that you might have. And then I believe that we have some time for question and answers, for questions rather, from the viewing audience. So, uh, Juliana, uh, that's probably yes. a question. So, um, it says, as you look around contemporary political movements, are there any that remind you of Mile? Who is the question for? So, uh, by any of you. Yeah, any of you. Uh, I don't know of any. The, the, the closest that comes to some of the immigrant groups, especially the dreamers, but the dreamers like, like LULAC seem to be only talking about themselves. <laughs> I'm not saying they want to close the immigration door, but they talk that way, that as long as they get their visas uh, arranged and fixed, DACA students, that's it. They, they don't talk about immigration reform. They don't have a comprehensive plan. Uh, so I'm a little concerned. Now there's some of the LGBT groups, especially Mi Gente, or Mi Gente, because they put a plus PJ out of Arizona, uh, they seem to be very direct action oriented and social oriented, social justice oriented, but we'll see. Agenda. Well, that's very limited. That's, that's very Nacho, can you respond? Can you add to that response? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jesse. Well, can you add to Angel's response? Are there any? Um, um, organizations currently that that, that might um, be indicative that, that they are mimic, mimicking or following Mayo as an example? Uh, no, uh, but um, what I find interesting is, for example, I live uh, in San Antonio, south of south of downtown, and uh, there's that uh, uh, Mennonite church close by, and they have consistently for the last three, three years uh, hosted, uh, uh, sometimes even underground uh, 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 migrant uh, people and people that have to uh, have escaped from Mexico. So I think the issue about the border uh, is gonna be, uh, remain important uh, on both sides of the border, uh, even if it's closed. They, they say it's closed, I don't know. I uh, haven't been down there lately, but uh, uh, there's still a lot of people coming back and forth and there's a tremendous need for people that are stuck in those uh, makeshift camps so that and support groups that, that have uh, arisen around uh, uh, those issues, uh, the migrant issues, both in, in Mexico and, and uh, uh, in Central America, and actually throughout the United States, because you know, uh, we impact just about everything uh, in the country. Uh, so uh, from that regard, uh, I, I agree with people out there, uh, maybe doing a little different uh, different way, uh, maybe more single issue oriented, and yeah, uh, that, as, as long as they move forward, I think they will encourage others. Let me put uh, uh, my uh, co-moderator on the spot here, even though she's not on the panel. Uh, Juliana, uh, uh, I know that you're, you're learning more about the, these kinds of issues and are involved somewhat, but what do you see among people your age or younger? 
Um, as far as I can think of right now, I mean, um, I know it, it's probably, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement is something similar that I see um, to kind of like the mile and like bringing, you know, attention to the to the problems that are that are happening in the political atmosphere that we are right now. out there that I'm pretty sure that um, kind of bring into light what what's going on so okay how do you, uh, I don't know what she's doing uh, locally in, uh, in New York I understand, if I recall correctly she's from the Bronx or from uh, Brooklyn uh, I used to live in Brooklyn so I understand uh, some of those issues uh, but um, uh, I think she's uh, a force to be reckoned with over the years uh, mm -hmm. to come. Uh, I certainly hope that she maintains her, her her energy and her and her focus in terms of uh, uh, the overall uh, emphasis in the Democratic Party. Uh, so, uh, from that regard, uh, I think there are uh, key people throughout the country uh, that may be like her. Mm -hmm. Angel, Mario, any reactions to that? No. no I mean, she's going to respond to, to them uh, and Puerto Rican issues. Now, in terms of all this Hispanic community, Puerto Ricans vote more like Mexican origin people than any other group. The Cubans are the ones that vote against us. Uh, some Central Americans do the same thing, especially the old school Nicaraguans, the ones from the Samosa camp and so on, uh, the elites, the oligarchs. So she's, she's going to do well because she's doing well for Puerto Ricans. The Puerto Ricans are very similar to us. Now, we have our own congressmen. You know, some that came out of Rasunida, Raul Grijalva came out of the Rasunida party in South Tucson. Uh, the, the, well, the, the Castro brothers, but, but they, 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 they never were in the Rasunida, but they, they came out of Raul Anida. Mom, Rosie, uh, and, and, and over in Harlandale, you know, Cito Rodriguez came out of the Rasunida party. Uh, yeah. he, he was in for some time. So we have had some members of Congress uh, that do represent our interests, but, you know, they it's one vote out of 435 so it's better to control your city and your county than it is to have a member of Congress. Uh, uh, some technical difficulties in hearing you let's try again um can un yeah. unmute go ahead uh, well unmute i'm just curious as to uh first of all i i think we we can transition here anyway to any other things or thoughts that the three of you want to share with us that we haven't touched on. So we'll let you go. It sounds like the technical issues are solved. Right. You need uh, I, I, I apologize for the issues, you know, with uh, the machines, but uh, I, I uh, wanted to, to address the point that Nacho made about other, other organizations right now, or there, the question of whether there are any organizations right now that could resemble what, you know, in, in any way or fashion, what my old was and did. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, as a title of the panel, as a lessons of the chief movement, one of the lessons that I see very clear is, is that the, uh, the need for organizing never stops. It has to continue. You know, when we started, I started. I stated, I stated earlier that uh, we set out to address the question of the, the system of white supremacy. You know, we wanted to overthrow it, and it was necessary to organize around that, empower people, organize our base, and go after what we wanted. And uh, we seem to have gained uh, some plot, you know, over the years. You know, and, and, and uh, uh, reaching those goals, but as we've seen. It has gone completely back to that time under the current rules. Uh, 
as elders, we need to do everything. We go out and organize and self-organize the communities and go on to challenge the powers of the system that, that is trying to put us down again. So again, uh, the organizing can never stop. We must go on. We must continually develop new leaders and uh, we must inspire the younger generations to be active, as active as we were at that time. Okay. In, in that light, uh, Angel and, and, and Nacho, are there any other, other final thoughts that you might want to share? I think there's a couple of points that we haven't brought up. Uh, Mayo, uh, uh, and then morphing into the rest of the party and all its other affiliates, we internationalized the Chicano movement. We traveled to China, to Cuba, to Quebec and Canada, to Spain, to Palestine. Uh, we, we traveled to a good number of countries in the world explaining what the Chicano movement was about and establishing relationships. Uh, later, as we got into elective office, uh, we were able to develop programs, you know, especially with, with Mexico. Uh, and, and, you know, this, this is an, an area that gets neglected somewhat. Now, on the demise of Mayo, I wanted to add, you know, we did have a, a, a secondary and tertiary leadership group within Mayo. For example, uh, uh, those of us that were the founders, we didn't be, become the first and last the Mayo leaders. Uh, you know, we had Carlos Guerra who, who, who developed uh, the Texas Institute for Educational Development. That was another nonprofit. Uh, we had Patlan who, who, well, when he was trying to get out of the Unity Council, uh, also created the Committee for Rural Democracy. Uh, we had uh, Luera, Alberto Luera, who also was a, a leader of, of, the, of Mayo at one, one time. Uh, and these newsletters that each chapter produced uh, and, and the central office produced exist in some libraries today, I, I, is my wish. But, you know, we, we even don't have a database of all the walkouts that we ever did. Uh, <laughs> because we our, our, our scholars and our research institutes don't seem to focus on, on want to count them and, and identify them yet they're there uh, so these are some areas that we did not uh, discuss well maybe uh, we we can impose on the university and on roger enriquez to have a follow-up to this next year but, uh, uh, jesse nacho can i mention something before you go before we turn yeah, it over yeah. we're not gone yet yeah Go ahead. Yeah, uh, there's a issue of arts and culture that we were very involved in also. Uh, Centro Cultural Atzlan, we formed that. Uh, uh, we were uh, supportive of uh, things like Bilingual Bicultural Mass Media Coalition out of California. Uh, uh, those things, even uh, in the early days of the uh, Wazwapi Cultural Arts Center. So I think the arts and culture and the mass media uh, are important issues that we need to look at as we uh, as we move forward as a community. Okay. As 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 the three of you survey the the, the current political social environment, what Chicano leaders stand out to you that impress Us. you? Us. Us. <laughs> None. <laughs> None? Uh, yeah, uh, you, know, you know, that's, that's a really uh, important question, Jesse. Uh, you know, we, we do have the leaders, yes, but they don't have the, the national standards that's required. Importantly, you know, that's a very real uh, uh, issue for, for our community is that uh, We don't have the national figures that are always talking the issue of telling now and I was talking about the mass media. When we look at all the talk shows, you see those faces of people. What color are they? And you see, look at their names. Very few of them are, are, are have a surname. Very few look like us. So that's a key area that needs to be addressed. Uh, we talked about uh, developer. Somehow or other, we never developed the media figures to be out there. We don't have anyone that has a prime time show on the national networks, on the cable TV. So 
that is a missing element that, 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 that we need so that our base could be reached and organized, if not by day-to-day -day action, at least by, by the message that's put across through the mass media. That is a very important area that we need to address as well as the, the, the lack of uh, power that we've been uh, um, missing you know, this few years. So national leaders, we don't have any. In my view, we don't have any Chicano or Latino national leaders, except for the up and come set. Uh, uh, and you in response to your question about AOC. Alexander Cortez is about the one that's, that's spoken out in recent years and has attained national stature. So okay. we need more. We need a, a, that can be and reach the state, that status, so that they can become influential people. All we have to point, you know, when, when, excuse me, when, whenever people talk about uh, <clears throat> who are the leaders, uh, Latino leaders, they always try out business figures, business people, or movie stars. That's it. But they are not necessarily the ones that have uh, the interest of the community, and, 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 and they don't work for that interest, toward that interest. They work for themselves, and that's the issue that we okay. need to develop leaders. And we started out way back leaders who not only have the perspective, but have the commitment that lasts a lifetime to be able to say, "I work for my community, I work for the people, and nobody else." So thank you, Mario. We have a couple of minutes for some Jesse. final thoughts. Yes, yes sir. Good for you. Go ahead. Uh, I'd be remiss, but not saying a little bit about uh, uh, Central America and Mexico and mm -hmm. South America as it relates to us. Willie sent me to Nicaragua in 1980. And uh, in the 90s, Southwest voter under Antonio and Andy, uh, uh, we spent about five, six years in Mexico and, and in Central America. I lived in El Salvador, taking the lessons we learned in voter registration kind of stuff, kind of how to use the media, how to, how to organize coalitions that can continue to do this kind of work. So I think that'll be uh, crucial in the years to come. Good, thank you. What, I, one last thing. One last thought. Continuing with uh, what we need to discuss next time, uh, and that is the <laughs> massive demonstrations that we used to organize. You know, when that famous case had a San Antonio, Demetrio Rodriguez, uh, Edgewood, the uh, school finance cases, the one that went to the Supreme Court, uh, I asked Mario, he thinks we marched in 1973. I, I know that we marched in, in 1970 and 71 on the economy furniture strike in the Austin, but for Demetrio Rodriguez and school finance, we marched on Austin, and, and I'm going to say this, it hadn't been repeated. We had about 10,000 people show up. We took down the U.S. flag. We took over the state capitol, including the governor's office. They all went out the back door. Today, that's why the, the U.S. flag and the Texas flag are on top of the capitol, so no one else can go and do that again. That's right. You did it, I guess. Okay. okay, we're going to have to uh, transition. Uh, we are uh, going to open uh, the door for people who have been viewing, and I hope that there are viewers out there um, who might want to ask some questions. And um, Juliana and I will take turns funneling those questions to either all three of you or to, or to the appropriate individual. So if you have questions, please send them in. Um, excuse me, Jesse, for a minute. Well, if I may, while we're waiting, you know, another hidden history and dimension, and Mario and Nacho can talk about this particularly, but I remember one of our core leaders, uh, 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 the gringo is the real enemy. That's who we had to eliminate and not each other. So that's why, at that particular time, there was peace in the barrio, and we recruited so many people to join Mayo and be active 
and social orientation causes as opposed to violence against each other. That has not been explored and that has not been discussed, much less documented uh, by, by people that have studied what, what we did. You know. Okay. We'll just take a few minutes and, and see what uh, what else want people want to address. Otherwise, feel free to continue the conversation, the three of you. Well, I was saying, well, I'm not sure that was stepped out, that we basically stopped the gang warfare in the West Side because we identified the gringo as the person we needed to eliminate, not each other. And I remember that, that you and Mario did most of that work in, in the west side of San Antonio. Uh, maybe you want to add about that, some, some conversation. Well, uh, we did have, a, 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 in particular, uh, Willie's brother, George, and his wife, Andrea, and uh, uh, several other people were uh, very much involved in uh, reaching out to, uh, uh, to some, of the, some of those uh, groups. Uh, in fact, uh, they had a, a, a house. Uh, we were able to rent a house for them where they could run the program. So uh, it started to be very successful uh, uh, to the point that uh, uh, our friend uh, Henry Gonzalez was. Uh, Paying real close uh, of the house and people that went in and, in and out, so in, inside those uh, uh, organizations, and uh, out of that came uh, the Brown Berets. Yeah. So uh, out of some of the courts and some out of those uh, neighborhoods off of Lupus Street. So there was a lot of activity uh, on all fronts, and uh, um, you know things that we didn't necessarily uh, start ourselves, but uh, were able to generate, and other people took uh, uh, took uh, the initiative. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to thank Angel and Mario and Nacho for all of your comments. Juliana, thank you for co-moderating this and Roger uh, Enriquez and all the others that took part, the technicians who probably had a little difficult time tonight. But we will do better next year. We will reconvene next year and continue this conversation. So again, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Gracias. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're clear. Well, it came out exactly the way we wanted it to come out. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it was good. I mean, the, the substance was all there. I, 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 I didn't jump immediately onto YouTube, and, but I was getting all these messages from people over my cell phone. And they were saying, there's no sound on YouTube. So I, I don't know what happened. Yeah, there was a there was a ghost of the machine error, uh, but we uh, we kind of restarted it and, and it and it came up. So these are some of the technical things that sometimes we don't even know what what happened. Right? Uh, I know the zoom I know the zoom on my end and uh, cut out a couple of times and restarted magically. So the magic of of Zoom is that it keeps going. Even if it dies out on my side, we were we were struggling with internet yeah, very the whole night. We were we were I was struggling. I was getting messages about internet connectivity all through this session. So it might be that in the evening there's more people on at home. I don't really know what what that was, but the uh, the issue of the YouTube, yeah, that's something that we probably have to let everybody know not to be monitoring YouTube and the Zoom at the same time, right? It causes yeah. a feedback loop, and so and unfortunately, in that moment, we were just trying to struggle to to, to yeah. communicate. I'd be interested in in hearing the audio to the Zoom recording.
because I'll bet because that was you're talking about being is bam 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 bam. It was like bouncing around like a yeah. Um, well, I, I have a I have a recording of this which I'm going to stop now.